stuff, and yeah. this is going live now, so <laughs> we're just uh, kind of toying around with the idea of the philosophy hangout, um, <laughs> just for anybody that might watch this on YouTube, but uh, we've been talking about Twitter versus Google Plus versus um, all the different other Facebook and all that jazz, and it actually stems from a conversation that we've been having with Jamie Krauthammel. Um but uh, after I've given that great introduction um, to zero viewers, <laughs> zero viewers, uh, I'm sure there are going to be crickets chirping. Um, so, uh, unintelligible teachers. Uh, I, I, isn't that like kind of redundant there? Uh, I don't think it's redundant. I think it's um, wasteful. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. if, if your role is to present knowledge and information to other people, having a large gap between where that knowledge is and where the student is is not an ideal scenario. You know, like your job as a teacher is to build this bridge. You know, and if you make the bridge go like this, it's it's not good. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's more of a, a a gradual sort of you know start from here and and you can slowly get some bits of understanding to move to here and that's okay but you know if you're on this side and and you speak English and the teachers over here and they speak Swahili it's a really difficult gap to bridge yeah uh, it's even more difficult when they think they're speaking English <laughs> but they're not um, right, right. I, I I remember this person that said something and it, it's so profound that I don't know that I understand it um, but the comment was, is that, and I believe it was on a TED Talk, the comment was that if a teacher can be replaced by a computer, they should be. <laughs> and this is not, it, it, in my interpretation of it, this is not a we should replace computer, uh, teachers with computers. It is a teacher should not be able to be replaced with a computer. Yeah. Um, the uh, the new thing now is one to one schools, where we've got middle schools and high schools where every kid has a laptop that they bring to school and the school has bought for them to take home and do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I see it as a neutral gain. I don't see it as something that's beneficial in of in and of itself being beneficial. Um, any thoughts on whether or not? forcing every kid to have a laptop and paying the money for every kid to have a laptop. Uh, could that money be used better, or is that a good well, use I mean, of the money? My, where my mind first goes with this is kind of the, the textbook scam. You know, like, textbooks are ridiculously expensive. Uh, looking at the textbook list for my next semester, it's going to be $1,000 uh, if I were to buy them all new. Okay, that's... $1,000. $1,000 if I were to buy or, them all new. And, and engineering, one semester. One semester. Well, engineering and some physics. And physics. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you ever cheater. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's only sixteen credit hours of the classes. So a thousand dollars for textbooks. My tuition is seven grand. That that doesn't make any sense, you know. In India, you can get the same textbooks for a hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, maybe not exactly, but less than two hundred, absolutely. Um. And it's just absurd that that kind of pricing exists. So one of my first thought is just that you know, if the textbooks can instead be on your laptop and all of it done for the same price, including the laptop, that that's great. You know, because you can at least have cost parity, hopefully have a price advantage. And I think that um, having that accessible format is, is beneficial. Now... Is it necessarily better? I don't know, but you know, certainly using computers is going to be required for anyone you know who ever graduates high school again, and most people even who don't make it that far. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I think the whole the idea of like the replacing the teacher with a computer um, is not necessarily a bad idea. In that, uh, looking at this, I've seen it referred to as the upside down classroom, um, mm -hmm. where like the, the current model is you attend school for the lecture, you go home to do the problems. 
Well, the upside down classroom is the other way around. At home or in your free time, you view lectures online or streamed in some format. Yeah. And have access to complimentary tutorials and things of that nature. And in class is when you do the homework, where there is a teacher who has the skills to help you with what you're missing doing the homework. So the teacher's role then becomes, well, you know, let me help little Johnny or Susie or whatever. I'll watch them doing this homework, or I'll come back around and check. And you know, their job would be to to view these kind of patterns. Oh, they're they don't understand, you know, a radical. Well, let me explain this again. You know, if if enough students are having this issue, you explain it again to the whole class. If just a couple are having the issue, you explain it to them individually. And the idea also with the upside down classroom is total mastery, where the student doesn't move on after they've reached a C grade competency. They move on after they have like a nine out of ten or a ten out of ten. And so you don't have this scenario where you you know, have this dimensioning return of how far you can go through your coursework because, well, you've gotten a C grade on the last ten things that are all required to understand this new thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's converging when you do that. The, the abilities of the student, the foundation is being developed in such a fragile way that it's converging the possibilities of that student. I think... I think you've been listening to a little bit of Solomon Khan's uh, yes, absolutely. advocacy. And it's, I, um, I actually I don't necessarily think he's him. the prophet, but he has some really, really great ideas. And I think the best thing about it, even with all the flaws, is that it's data-centric. You know, it's yeah. based on data. It's not based on, well, this is kind of what I think is going on, or it's not, well, this is what the teacher feels is the case. It's, look, this is demonstrable that here is the... Um, efficiency, you know, here's the part where this student is behind, and I can address that directly, you know, so instead of having like this cluster bomb of a tool, well, let's just throw all of the things at all of the students, you have this smart bomb, you know, or even an exacto knife kind of precision, you know, where you can go in and say, this is exactly where the missing point is, let's address this and bring everybody up, you know, and allow them to go on at their own pace. Yeah, yeah, I love, um, I don't know if you've played around with the basic math stuff in, in Khan University, uh, and I don't really remember how many points I have in Khan, but I love the, the Khan Academy thing, the website. Um, I went, uh, and I was actually doing the basic math stuff, and, and Khan's idea um, is that if you can do something ten times in a row without, without getting it wrong, then you have achieved a mastery of that subject. Um, so in, if, if we were to take that mentality and make it into a school, then you know, when, you're, when you're in third grade, you're doing multiplication tables. And once you master multiplication tables, then you can move on to the next. And when you master that, you can move on to the next. And it's completely unlimited in a fixed time frame. And I think that that is a really interesting way to go about it because you're always challenging a student. Um, I think that neither me or my brother, I don't think that education worked extremely well for us because it wasn't challenging to us, if that makes any sense. I think that, I think that education works for the average below average student. And I think that super below average and above average, I, I think that it completely loses those people. I, I think so, but I think it's worse than that even, because even the people within the average range that have a different learning style are also lost. So you kind of have this fishing net that you're throwing out there to try to like cater to the least common denominator, but you're losing the high individuals that could exceed beyond what you're teaching you're losing the individuals that are behind that could be brought up to speed and you're losing the people who are you know an average and could excel just fine but because they have a different perspective of the world even they're losing out um, you know I can't I can't tell you how many times and I can't think of a specific example but thinking back you know growing up through school like a, a teacher would say something that was ambiguous and I would get you know, I would answer that question wrong because 
there's five different ways that you could take the meaning, you know. And because I didn't choose what was the obvious meaning to them, of course I'm gonna I wouldn't wasn't gonna do as well. Um, right. And I mean that's just one example, but I'm sure that there are many other kind of perspectives um, that you know other students have had that were barriers to them that that perspective could have been turned into an advantage instead of a disadvantage. Absolutely. I mean, I, we've had this conversation before, and this is one place where me and you are complete opposites. Um, I continually, like, emulate what somebody's expecting from me and then <laughs> infer lots of things on that and then give them the answer they want, not necessarily the answer that is the correct one in yeah, the case yeah. of tests. Um, you know, whereas you dig deeper and deeper and deeper into it and, you know, project meaning onto something um, that's more intelligent than the question ever could have been, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, no, it, it does. Um, but, you know, it's it's sometimes hard to, to know what the person is asking, you know? And that actually comes <laughs> up a lot in physics, because physics... Oh, it does. Physics, it's... <laughs> You have to know what you can ignore in physics. And somebody that's very, very literal doesn't, like, it doesn't make sense to ignore friction. You know, like, you know, these, these ideal states, well, why are we talking about ideal states? Because ideal states don't exist. <laughs> We're talking about physics, which is supposed to describe the real world, so why are we ignoring friction? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely had some difficulty there in my earlier physics classes. I'm a physics major. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but um, uh, you know, I, I thought of things too literally. You know, I came from a trade where I had to make things work yeah. to a classroom, and so someone's giving me the scenario, and I'm like thinking of all these variables that should be included, you know. But really, that does you know, you don't get there until uh, you know, mechanics, <laughs> classical yeah. mechanics, yeah. Yeah. um, or or dynamics in in engineering. And I still um, can't keep you from like, talking to me in BTUs. <laughs> 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 Sorry, continue. continue. Oh, that's funny. Um, but yeah, uh, it, I've, I've lost my train of thought there a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a story, and I was trying to find it here to remind myself what it was, because I don't remember the details, but... Um, there's a story about a student who took his exam, uh, a physics exam, was, you know, physics 101 in college, and it was just basic kinematic questions, like it was something to do with a stopwatch, and um, you know, measuring the height of a building with a stopwatch or something like that. And his answers that he gave, and he failed the test. Like there was like ten different questions. That was just one of them I remember. Um, the answers he gave were legitimate, you know, you, but they weren't what the professor was looking for. Right. And um and he I don't know if it was a true story or not. It seems like it was it was a true story, but I don't know for sure. But um, you know, the student uh protested his grade, you know, and said, Hey, uh, I want you to take another look at this and so they go to the department head and, you know, looking through it, the department heads, well, you know, you didn't really ask you didn't really answer the way he was wanting you to answer, but your answers show an understanding of physics. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Oh, oh, I remember one of the examples was using a barometer uh, explain how you can determine the height of a building. Well, instead of describing kind of, you know, the difference in barometric pressure, he said, well, um, throw the barometer off the top of the building and count how long until it's the ground. <laughs> um, you know, another answer was <laughs> Beautiful. tie a rope to it and, you know, lower it down, measure the rope. Um, yeah, so he gave these... these uh, it's a plumb bomb. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. Uh, so, oh, another one that was great was, uh, you know, weigh the barometer, pie on a rope, lower it down, set it swinging, and time the swing to determine... <laughs> he wants to use a pendulum motion to figure out the arc of the... Holy crap. <laughs> holy crap. And, uh, that's, yeah, that sort so of stuff is brilliant to me. Yeah, and... Um, you know, and you just keep all kinds of answers like this. You know? and, that's um, the great thing about physics. So, is so that yeah, it's like that's the kind of thing you want to encourage. Not yeah, you don't yeah. want to f that guy. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't want to give that guy an f. You <laughs> want that guy to go on and do things. You know, <laughs> you know, physics is, is an area an engineering should be. Yeah, an, a very left and right brain kind of. Um, 
brain is, is failing on the noun, but, you know, activity. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, it's, um, it's, it's interesting because that's very much a physics thing because if you've got a closed system, you can, you can talk about it from energy or you can talk about it from location and, and movement. So there, there's, you know, there is a, there's different ways you can look at the same system, and, and that is forward thinking. You know, he, that that kid is not blinded by the fact that he's got a barometer. He has to use it to be a barometer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess in the story I read, anyway, he was allowed to retake the test. But um, this time the professor asked much more specific questions, mm. so like using this theory, da 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 da. And so then he was able to go through and he got an A. Um, so but it was just an awesome, you know. Yeah, and I can, I can remember, you know, when, when I was at Pitt with uh, Charles Goodman, who I adore. Yeah, he's good. Some of his answer questions were a little vague. And in some cases where I was legitimately confused, I just answered both ways. Mm, that's awesome. <laughs> and, and um, or I would, you know, sometimes I'd, I would ask him, but like, if I, like, usually what I would do is go through the test first. And if I had extra time, I would just answer it both ways. And if I didn't, I would ask him. Um, but uh, you know, and he was great with that. He, you know, he encouraged that, and yeah. I think that's that's the way it ought to be. For um, for our one viewer that is currently viewing us, we've been talking some philosophy about education. Uh, I have a degree in physics. He's working on a degree in physics. Uh, working on a degree in engineering. And uh, if people would like to join in on the conversation, uh, you just have to send me a message. Uh, invitations are possible. This will be a moderated discussion. Uh, but anyway, so walk me through um, an example of a really good teacher and what made this teacher of yours a really good teacher. Is there that one teacher that actually did a good job? Uh, I wish I'd had more time to consider this question because now it's going to be kind of this dead space while I, while I think about my answer. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll talk about that one teacher for me if, if you'd like. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, the, uh, my fifth grade teacher, um, and it will take me a minute to remember her name, Maddox, Miss um, Maddox. Uh, she was the crazy, eccentric, like, loony, like, <laughs> teacher that uh, was the one using, like, conjunction, junction, what's your function type stuff, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it, <laughs> learning was fun to her, and it was, it, it was, it was definitely her calling. Um, that teacher was, was very interesting. There was there was an AG program we called it. It's called TIP some places, but it's academically gifted. Um, and the um, the three teachers there, I don't remember them specifically. They had di very different personalities. But uh, this was a I believe a sixth grade thing that I was doing. It may have actually been a fifth grade thing. Um, but we built bridges out of toothpicks, and, I mean, you're talking these awesome, like, lattice-type bridges, and then we weighed them to see how, how much, uh, you know, it would take to break these things. And uh, not to brag, but we actually had to get a paint can out to break mine, um, you know, and we're talking, like, toothpicks and glue. Um, but, you know, like, that sort of thing... I think is probably why I ended up getting a degree in physics. It's, you know, like early on, like I'm fascinated by these things. I, I made one of the, the Plinko pegboards out of nails and rolled the ball down. And, you know, I'm like, you know, and somebody could have totally told me about stats and how stats works in that moment, you know, like the aggregate function. And what, you know, like based on, you know, do like a, a, a Six Sigma sort of thing, that would have been a perfect opportunity to explain to a sixth grader what Six Sigma was and how with the results of 100 tests we can predict what, the, you know, sort of thing. Um, but there were a few rare gems uh, in school, and I think that some of that is, is because of the lack of a Solomon Khan type Khan Academy um, mentality. And we need more dynamic one-on-one -on -one relationships in teaching, um, but that doesn't mean that we need one teacher per five students either. 
Yeah, I think that um, I moved around a whole lot, so it's difficult for me to think back and be like, oh, I had this one teacher, because rarely did I have a teacher for a whole year. So. Oh um, wow. <laughs> and that's you know an odd place to be, but there was a science teacher in uh, Greenfield, Ohio, whose name I can't remember. Maybe it'll come to me. But um, you know, he took me aside and said, you know, you're really good with this stuff. Um, it was a, it was in a science class, and he was like, I'd like you to go take this uh, this statewide science competition. Uh, I'd like you to go take the test. And uh, I was in the eighth grade, and it was a seventh through senior level test, and uh, I got thirteenth in the state as an eighth grader. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't even finish my uh, my eighth grade science class, you know, versus even with other seniors in there. Wow. Not to be too egotistical, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, and that was a really great moment for me. Like, not even being first base. Okay, whatever. You know. Yeah. You know, I did pretty good considering where I came from, and yeah. that, that was a really great moment to realize that hey, you know, I can, I can actually understand these things. You know, I, these things make sense. But it's hard for me to pinpoint. Well, I'll, I'll you bring up for the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You, you bring up an interesting point there. Is that you were thrilled with thirteenth point right, <laughs> because of you know, your perspective, and. You know, like all of the formidable people in, in, in my upbringing, like my coach for baseball and, um, you know, like the competition for uh, – I did a Skills USA drafting competition, um, sort of like what you're talking about. And, you know, like it was all about first place, <laughs> you know. And, and the one thing that you don't get in the real world – is there is no first place. <laughs> Warren Buffett's already there, and there's no chance <laughs> that I will ever make that much money. And, you know, the Microsoft guy's already there. And, you know, my name doesn't happen to be, um, I can't even remember the Facebook guy's name, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. You know, like, I mean, you know, not to take anything away from those people, but it's not that those people were number one. It's that they were in the right place at the right time with the right idea, and there were there was a lot of chance that was involved in that, you know. And and they didn't take home a first place ribbon because they won the internet or you know <laughs> won computing or anything like that. So I, I find it extremely profound that you know, considering all, I made thirteenth place. You know, like that's yeah. awesome. You so know, I, I just, as a, as an eighth grader, you know, everyone above me was a senior. You know, yeah. so that was really great. But um, you know, something else that that I often think about that other people don't seem to consider is, to the person at the median, you know, to the person that's at at the center of the bell curve, the person at you know 98 percentile and 99 percentile are, are indistinguishable. Yeah. You know, they're they're so far from where they are, uh, you know, in any given particular you know narrow focus, that they can't tell the difference between those skills. You know, the first place and second place MMA fighters, you know, go out and fight some random guy on the street. There's no distinguishable difference, you know. Yeah. And often at that level, there's even amount of luck, you know, and not just in, in martial arts, but you know, all kinds yeah. of avenues. The difference at those high percentiles from the median are so great that it doesn't even matter, you know. Like top 15 places are way freaking better than the average jet, you know, yeah. in any competition. So, and we don't ever, we don't seem to respect that, you know. Like we don't. Uh, one thing, like if people always come up to me and they're like, oh, well, I mean, it, it hasn't been in a while, but when you know, I was right out of school and people are like, oh, what's your degree in, you know? And it's like applied physics. They're like, well, really? And I'm like, uh, what's your degree in? And they're like, oh, I'm getting a doctorate. I'm getting a, 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 a in not. Uh, medical stuff. I don't even know what it is. Like, I'm not smart enough to know what the medical degrees are. And I'm like, I, I, biology completely is just, like, way over me. You know, like, I don't <laughs> get it. I understand, like, the the, the physics of, of how your bicep works, but I'm lucky that I know that's a bicep. <laughs> um, and you can't really call it a bicep. I need to work out. But anyway, it... It's so funny to me that, I mean, we are so, like, as, as human beings, we have so many facets that it's sad that we see somebody in first place in anything and go, 
that's the only person we need to focus on. <laughs> you know? And I hate to make a, a reference to American Idol, but I would by far say the second place American Idol people have been more successful than the first place American Idol people. <laughs> You know, and, and I think that American Idol is starting to realize that, and they're bringing five people on tour with them now. You know, these were all the people that had hundreds of thousands of votes. Hey, they might have a chance selling a few records if somebody's willing to, like, on their phone, like, just over and over and over again. <laughs> I've seen a guy hold three cell phones in text, 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 text to vote for his favorite, and I'm like... <laughs> If a guy will do that, if a guy will spend five dollars in text messages, he will buy a song from this person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Of course, um, text messages costing money that dates me. Um, <laughs> well, some people don't have unlimited plans, so. But I mean, uh, kind of trying to tie it back to the education ideas. Um, you know, I, I think that um, that is something that needs to be incorporated. Is, is to somehow allow people to internalize that. You know, second place is not the same as last place. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. especially when you've got a big group. You know, like, all right, if there's only ten people in your class, all right, sure, first place kid is probably the only one good at that thing. If you've got twenty thousand people in a competition, the top ten people are, are all freaking awesome. <laughs> that's that's one thing. Like the way that I see education is is the, the way that education was set up when I was coming through high school was there was a CP class which was the we don't really think you're actually going to graduate. Um, you know, there was uh, an honors class and there was a, an AP class. And I, I'm sorry, that was a bit offensive. Um, but, you know, like, the honors was the college prep class. And, you know, that was what we were prepping people to do college. AP was, you're going to get credit out of this class for college. Um, and I think it was even a general below CP, but, um, you know, anytime there's a rigid caste system, I think that there's an issue. And what I think should be done instead of that is, is maybe a three, maybe a five-tier system where when you're in the top five in your class, you now are in the next class. Even if that's a week in the school, or if that's nine weeks in the school, or if that's, you know, five years in school, you know, hey, we want you to try and perform at this level, and we want you to see what you think about being in this class at this pace. Um, and I just think that would be a much better system where, where people can go, hey, yes. this level five stuff is too high for me. I really felt good and it was my place in level four or, you know, whatever it might be. That just seems to me that, you know, instead of there being that one really smart kid, <laughs> you throw those kids into the, you know, the top level. And instead of the class having to move at the 75% rate of the average person, each class can move at its own rate. Now, Saying that, I realize that, you know, like, that kind of limits the fluidity between them. Um, but I don't think that that's fluidity. I, I don't think that that should – I think you've got to keep it from being a caste system. No, I agree. And I think, like, one of the one of the current limits is, like, the um, – I forget the name of the system, but the uh, the current, like, advanced placement courses in, in middle school – Unless you excel in all subjects, they won't let you into those. So, like, if you're a person that excels at math, but is is only okay at English, um, they won't let you into the advanced placement courses. <laughs> you have to be good at it all before they'll let you in. And they purposely place these restrictions on there because they want it to be something for elites only. Like, yeah. the school boards want to, and administrators want to point at these programs and say, oh, look at these awesome kids we've produced. They're good at yeah. everything. You know, and so they'd rather have five kids that they can point to as their darling childs than have 20, uh, among whom many are very skilled in certain subjects. And yeah, I think... I think that's, that's a, a sad loss. You know, that, that hurts broader education in general as well as specific individuals. Yeah, I think I think that's a huge, huge miss. Um, 
And one example of that at the collegiate level, and I've invited a few more people to see if they'll come, um, but you know, kind of open up the conversation a bit because uh, we are back down to zero viewers. Um, but uh, one of the uh, one of the things at the collegiate level that I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen it, it is very apparent in physics, is that there are weed out courses, and. Mm -hmm. You know, 98% of all the students that a physics program will oversee are just taking the basic courses that are the college weed out courses. And it felt to me like once you've gotten to the next level course, physics was, was open arms. And you didn't fail because you sat there. And it didn't matter because everything was relative. <laughs> Thanks, Einstein. Um, but... In the, in the basic courses, the basic courses were harder in physics than the advanced courses because all you had to do was sit there, smile, and nod in the advanced courses, and you'd get a C. Where in the, the beginning courses, it was, it was this protectionism of we're physics professors, and we're smarter than you are, and you need to know that you're stupid. And that's yeah, my, just always just I mean that may be ah, true to me. some extent, but my, my sense has been that um a lot of instructors have animosity towards like the freshman student who's there because they have to be and who's constantly, you know, not doing their homework or not paying attention or being problematic in some way. And I think that they kind of have a bias that, well, you know, this physics 101 class, that's all these students are, you know. These aren't physics major students. These aren't yeah. students who are really here to excel and to achieve and to learn something. They're here because mommy and daddy are paying tuition, and they told them, well, they have to go to college. <laughs> it could be a jaded thing. It really, and, it really and I really feel that's what it is because, you know, like, um, I don't know, not to call out Dr. Kinney, but uh, Dr. Kinney at ECU is very much like that, you know, like, it, you know, I've seen him do it. He's given his lectures, you know. He is an asshole, yeah. which is fine, you know. But Mr. Wizard was an asshole, too, so it's all good. But um, Dude, you just completely <laughs> I, I, – I'm going to go burn my physics degree because it is, it is probably Mr. Wizard's fault. <laughs> <laughs> and now but, you're telling me but, that my you know, childhood and, hero and then I've seen is an asshole. Like, wait, this, what am I supposed um, to do with that? This, uh, you know, but I've seen people come up to him after class, you know, this freshman courses – and he's nice to them, you know. He's straight yeah. with them. He's welcoming their questions because he knows that this is an individual that's not caught in his kind of stereotype net of a freshman. You well, know that, I mean? that's, like, that's interesting commentary on sociology versus individuality. You know, like one person never riots. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, anyway, it's kind of a, it's kind of a different different angle on it. But but I find that really interesting. But, uh, I mean, I think there's definitely some jadedness there, you know what I mean? And, yeah. like, um, yeah. Which, I don't know uh, how to change it. I don't know enough about that system to yeah. make a lot of commentary there. No. Um, hmm. So, uh, have you spent very much time on Khan Academy? Um, I have. Uh, mostly just viewing his videos. <laughs> okay. They make really good refreshers, and actually, as I've come through my college courses, they're really good homework aids and just supplements for my understanding. Um, they're not necessarily the most ideal layout, and there's a lot of people out there who have made websites criticizing his videos, and that's fine, but I think that um, they're a very useful supplement to current programs. I, I, I don't get why somebody would want to... Would would want to criticize um, somebody that's of, trying. Most to Most of the something. criticisms I've seen uh, champion the idea that he's you know promotes education and learning, but they disagree in a uh, pedagogical sense, like that uh, they feel the way he teaches is improper, and that they feel like he focuses on how you solve the problem and not on a deeper understanding of the mathematics behind that problem. But I think that um, that criticism is a little myopic because if you watch like a series of videos, they all build upon these principles. You know, the, the video, the intent is, well, let me boil this down to 10 minutes and give you as much understanding both in the mechanics of this problem and the um, 
how to solve this problem, but it's a very narrow focus to where you should be when you're first solving that problem. So, you know, for example, when you're doing um, differential equations, he's not going to focus on explaining to you what a derivative is because you should have already known what a derivative is, and yeah. you know, and you approach those subjects in earlier videos. Um, and I think, though, also the other reason that criticism is not so great is that um, even if you only learn through sort of a a bare bones, this is how it works, this is how I do it, you had to have also gained an understanding. And the more kind of high level connections between issues you can make later, you know, when you're when you're actually considering subjects and um, applications to these problems, you can make those connections independently. But if you don't understand the fundamentals and you don't understand how to solve the problem, you're never going to come to that understanding. See, I think it's a little backwards in that criticism to come from a, a more high level place and say, well, you need to understand this first when I don't, I don't think that's the case. You know, I think it's just fine to start out, hey, I can solve this problem. Yeah. Now, this, uh, now go solve a thousand of these problems and tell me what you think this means. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I think there is a lot to be left, left to the student there, but I think that it's such a radically different, like, I'm not suggesting that cons should be the only thing the students use, but I would ex suggest that it is a great supplement to what students use. Um, so. And it's, I was going somewhere, and my brain has just left me. Um, um, something else I wanted to throw out is, yeah. like, it reminds me of um, uh, my old sensei when I used to do martial arts heavily. You know, when I had a question about the technique, he would say, well, do it a thousand times, and then we can talk about it. Um, you know, so the idea was just to give you enough of a basic mechanic initially that you can start practicing it. Yeah. Now, you do it a thousand times and gain your own direct insight into this. And then you can you know, and then you you can understand enough to ask questions about it, you know? Yeah. The the, the thing I think that, that works with other things too. Oh yeah, the, the thing that came to me was uh, I think it was uh, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, Ted Talk. Um, about learning, and uh, that with some other stuff kind of thrown in together. Basically, the, the commentary was that, that when you learn how to walk, you learn through imitation. When you learn how to talk, you learn through imitation. It's, it's, it's repeated attempts at, at doing something, and it's not that you understand why you're doing it. I mean, with talking, you know, it's goos and it's gahs and it's and it's and it's just learning to vocalate and it, it vocalate. That's that's a new word. Learning to you know uh, to control your speech and 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 to control your vocal cords and to not hit your mic. Um, but um, <laughs> you know, like it's it, a lot of childhood is imitation. It's this this monkey see monkey do sort of sort of thing and only after doing it the thousand times that you're talking about, like it dawns on you that, that this has meaning. When I do this, I get a reaction when mm -hmm. I say this. And then you infer the meaning of these words. Uh, and then you build enough, a, a big enough structure that they, the, the structure itself can teach you more. Um, but one of the things that, that Sir Ken Robinson had said was that um, we have taught ourselves to despise failure that if a kid gave up after the fifth try of trying to stand, they'd never learn how to walk. <laughs> and I, I always thought that was extremely profound. Yeah, no, I, and that's actually something I've, I've struggled with a lot in the last few years in my kind of return to academia is that, um, you know, I've always been kind of a perfectionist. But I'm having to come to grips with the fact that, you know, making mistakes is the only way to ever get anywhere. You know, you can't, do it all perfectly all the time, expecting yourself to do so not only um, sets you up for hard falls emotionally, but it uh, it limits you from doing interesting things, you know, because you get to this point, well, well, I don't feel I can do that perfectly, therefore I'm not going to do it at all. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to get to this place where you realize that there's no such thing as perfection, you know, that you there is no ideal that can be attained. You have to just do the best you can 
And if you don't even try, you're certainly not going to get there. And yeah. um, I mean, it's when, easy to say at a cognitive level, but to internalize that it takes a great deal of effort for a person who is a perfectionist. No, absolutely. One comment from a high level, this is a hangout level, is uh, viewer number one, uh, if you would like to join us in the hangout, if you'd like to talk, uh, you are welcome to send me a message via Google+, and we will get you in on this. Uh, and comment number two uh, was completely lost. Uh, I've got to start writing these things down. And <laughs> in high school, um, a good buddy of mine, Tim, uh, we had this teacher, Mrs. Moore, which is another one of those great teachers. I, I, I'd like to actually talk to her again. Uh, biology, I don't understand it, but somehow she let me through. Um, but we would be talking, and, and she was, it, we were freshmen, so we were awful. And she was working on getting us to be, like, there were a lot of different levels that she was hitting us at. Uh, and one was to be functional in a group. You know, when you go, ooh, 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 that didn't do anything with her because she's saying something now, you know, and she'd give you this dirty look of, you know, shut up, I'll get to you when it's, when the adult is ready to get to you, when the conversation is at a point. And uh, viewer number one went away. Um, so the, um, so anyway, he would start, like he would have a question, and she would talk for five minutes, and he'd have his hand raised the entire time. And she'd look over, and she'd go, yes, Tim, I'm ready for your question. And he goes, what? She had your question. <laughs> what are you talking about? Tim, you've got your hand raised. Write it down, Tim. <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got to give that guy a hard time about that because it's just absolutely hilarious to me. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I, so that's what I'm reminded of every time that I go, ooh, I forgot what I was thinking about. <laughs> I'll put my hand down now. Yeah, seriously, I'll <laughs> shut up. Um, but, uh, ooh, sorry, you were talking about something before I interrupted you. Oh, I just have to put my hand down on that one. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just <laughs> out. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, so, is there any way that I can see like how many people are viewing? I don't know how this um, thing works. In the upper right hand corner, I think I'm the only one that gets the gets the ability to see that there is only one viewer. So I see. Um, well, that but, is awesome. <laughs> yes, yes, that viewer is awesome, and seriously, you can join us if you'd like, because uh, we're just two talking heads at the moment. Now, this is something that I want to do on a regular basis, and it's something that when we get two and three and four people more in the, in the conversation, I will do more of an active job of, uh, of, of moderating. I think uh, one thing that you've expressed to me, uh, Ash, was uh, we'd love to do this on a local level, but I think that this is a good start. Um, you know, and we'll get three or four people in here and, and, and we'll get some varied, varied input. Um, it might be too late, dude. <laughs> I just, I'm going somewhere and it's just stopping. <laughs> um, but the core of this whole thing is that, that we want it to be intelligent conversation. We want it to, you know, we want it to be respectful and that's fundamental I I will you know if things get heated I will do my best to moderate it and if people get to the point where they can't be in the same room I will politely ask you for some way to leave um, you know so I just for people in the future that might be watching this uh, that might want to join in I just want them to know that we can violently disagree in a very respectful way. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, also entertaining the the violent agreement. I don't know if you ever uh, encountered that. But two people agree, but disagree on why they agree. It's, it's awesome. Awesome. I I have, to, I, have argued, I have argued. I have argued, and then realized that we're saying the exact same thing, <laughs> and we're both idiots. Uh, yeah, but um, no, I definitely would be interested in being part of a discussion and even more so is getting some, some input on these these kinds of thoughts by other people, you know, like 
I love for someone to say, well, you know, have you considered this? And my answer is no. You know, like that's that's an awesome place to be. <laughs> no, I've never thought about that. Um, let's go further with that sort of thing. Uh, something that would be good though is if, uh, maybe we could have kind of some preordained topics, like not necessarily a, a strict thing topic we're going to stick to, but maybe just kind of some bullet points um, of things we're going to discuss so that uh, you know people can be more prepared if they actually want to say something. Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of an ad hoc, you know, hey, we're talking anyway, so let's post this. And, and I wish we actually would have gotten more of the, the Twitter versus Facebook versus that conversation because that was interesting. Um, but yeah, I will uh, I will come up with a couple of you know like a list of points of okay if the if the the conversation is getting stale as it is right now, uh, you know we're talking about boring stuff about you know structural stuff, but um, then you know we'll we'll move on. Um, did uh, did you happen to catch the Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, that I shared earlier um, about planets and Pluto? Uh, I did not read it. No. It's a, it's an hour and a half of uh, of him talking. Um, oh, video. Yeah, it's oh, great. Awesome. It was a Google Talk, which Google Talks are a great place to uh, to, to find stuff as well. Um, but uh, he was talking about how the naming convention of planets and how his group put. Planet Pluto in a different group than the rest of the planets and did not call it a planet, but that was kind of the precipitating action of why Pluto got demoted. Um, and I made a, a ridiculous comment the other day um, about what I think Pluto should be called from now on that I just cannot live without it having, you know, planet in its name, yeah. um, which is where that video came from. Uh, I will now call Pluton or Charto, a subplanetary supercouple. Uh, if you have four kids, you're an adult. It has four moons. Um, at least put planet back in the classification, which makes me an idiot because it's a subplanet, I think, or it's dwarf planet. I think dwarf is planet the is the word. Yes. So anyway, that that makes me an idiot. But uh, let's put planet back in this classification. They were even adopted, referring to the kids. You know, I mean, it's not like they birthed it. You know, well, the birth of um, I think the biggest uh, uh, hurdle there is that um, you know, if you if you say Pluto is a planet, you have to say Eris is a planet. And so we can either have eight planets or we can have ten, possibly eleven. Um, Actually, the number goes up Ceres way high. Sharon's. Yep. But anyway, I'm not sure how many of those dwarf bodies there are, but. Eris certainly is is larger than the main body of Pluto, so um, it's kind of like, well, how many planets do we want? And uh, I don't know, to me, it's not really a big deal. It's kind of just this semantic uh, yeah. distinction it, uh, that it doesn't really matter. You know, okay, it's this diameter. I don't yeah. really care what you call it. You know? <laughs> it, it, it actually breaks down: is the planet round? There, there are three parts of the classification: is the planet round, and that's a function of how much mass it has. Uh, you know, like planets don't roll around to get their roundness. You know, it's just a function of of the, I guess, tidal forces is not the right word, but just the gravity forces you to be spherical. Well, and I'm um, sure there must be some mathematical description of how spherical is that sphere, you know, because even Earth is not really a sphere, so it's kind of like, well, it's round is round, you know. Plus it, if, you, if you were to, and, and this is quoting directly from Neil, um, because we're on first name basis. Um, if if you were to take the Earth down to the size of a cue ball, it would be the most perfectly manufactured cue ball ever made. Um, the I forget what the what the radius of the Earth is, uh, but his point was is that the lowest point on Earth is six miles deep, and the highest point on Earth is five and change high. So that percentage of the total, um, you know, I mean, the, the only reference that I've got right off is the prime meridian is um, is 10,000 10, kilometers? Holy crap, what's wrong with me? No, 10,000 meters. I'm sure Wolfram Alpha has that answer. Yes. <laughs> what is the radius of the Earth? Because what I'm getting at is uh, 40,000 Something. Radius of the Earth is uh, almost 4,000 miles. 
4,000 miles is the radius of the Earth. Okay, so what is the percentage of of, uh, of six by <laughs> 4,000? Yeah, so uh, the Earth is flat within 0.15% uh, um, deviation at those two specific points, and everything else is much, much less than that. Um, Neil, uh, Neil even went into, and, and you might as well just watch it instead of me talking about it for an hour and a half because he did a much <laughs> greater job of it. Um, but it was really interesting. The second one, uh, other than it being big enough to become round, uh, the second one was um, that it is the primary orbiting body around the sun. So it can't be a moon and round and be a planet, effectively. Right. Um, so that was char on away. Um, and the next one was that it has to have the gravitational field to clear its path around the sun. Um, and that's where Pluto failed was that Pluto is in this junky, you know, like, uh, ice, you know, just wasteland, um, whereas the Earth just, like, grabs and grabs and grabs everything that it runs over. Um, Pluto would have to get very much larger to pull the other 27 known dwarf planets or whatever it is. Yeah, dwarf planets or whatever it is. Um, it's very interesting. Definitely worth worth watching, and not listening to me talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I have to review some of the math on that. But I mean, still, you you know, you have Eris. So if you say Pluto is a planet, you gotta have to say Eris is a planet at minimum. So, um, which I'm okay with, but uh, yeah. a lot of people aren't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the um the the other really interesting thing that was said. Um, was that they were looking for Planet X, and Planet X, which was the amount of, uh, it was a, it was a projection of the difference of uh, Newtonian mechanics around, you know, like gravitational fields and all that type of stuff, and it was the what they couldn't what they couldn't quantify about how the planets moved, like there was this missing body. Uh, and it all boiled down to a guy that cleaned the gearbox and his telescope every time before he before he looked. So his entire, like, everything from this one telescope was wrong because he was meticulous about cleaning it. And as he cleaned it, it went further and further out of alignment. <laughs> so that was enough to statistically sway the orbits of the planets because it was throwing all these measurements in together and, and doing this mathematical model. And they were looking for a planet that wasn't there. It was a guy cleaning his telescope in a place that he shouldn't be cleaning his telescope. <laughs> That's really funny. I, I enjoyed it. But uh, anyway, I think I'm going to end this broadcast, even though we just added a viewer that had gone away. Uh, I think we're going to end this broadcast and uh, start talking about some more personal stuff. Okay. Um, but I do want to say that this is something that I'd like to happen on a regular basis. I'd like to get some feedback on it. Uh, ideally, I'd want four people in the room, uh, including myself, so we can have uh, a bit of a more dynamic interchange and uh, get some more, more varied input. But uh, Ash Smith, good buddy of mine, Danny Rankin, <laughs> And uh, we will see you again maybe in a week, maybe two. We'll work out a schedule. Uh, but check the pages. Bye.